Lori. <clears throat> You're muted, Lori. Oh, we see you, Lori. Paul Dry. Oh, yeah. Paul. Oh, I see Paul. Paul Slowy. No. Wendy. Hey, Wendy. I'm, I'm here. Hi. And Dan Haynes. And Jeff, do we have? Vince. Vince. Hi, Vince. He's here in reference to the Arbor class. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes from last night, last month's meeting? Amy, seconded. Uh, Lori, I think. Lori, we can't hear you. Is your volume on? Lori? Can you hear me? There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Okay, Chairman's remarks. I'd just like to um, welcome our two new members, Dan Haynes and Emma Hahn. Hahn? Yeah, is that right? Um, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Here from virtual area. Email us or call us if you think of anything. 
like, you know, hey, would, you know, maybe if you added this question or added this on it, we'd really like some input before we roll it out and really start showing it to the municipal. And um, kind of along that same lines with the referral form is the actual report that we're producing for you. Um, on the report, we find that we spend a lot of our time when we put together the reports laying out the actual section, which we go through, but just listing off each section out of the individual municipality code is kind of time consuming and pretty redundant. And we felt that it might not be a very useful tool for you guys. You know, we we'd like some feedback. Are you are you looking into those codes and using that section? referral or are you just reading the meat of our report? Um, we want to show you the information in, in the cleanest and easiest way for you guys to kind of disseminate it and digest it. So you know, we don't we don't want to be too redundant or give you give you too much information. So you know and, and with that, is there anything that anybody can see with these any suggestions or comments? I know, Amy, you've seen a ton of these from a lot of different municipalities. And again, you know, you can take some time, call us or email us anytime if you think of anything. Um, but th this is just, a, you know, out to the current project um, and used it as the example. So you could kind of see side by side, you know, what, what we've done in the past and kind of what we're proposing to change. We also don't want to take out any information that anybody uses often. And the same thing, uh, the same thing kind of holds true with the agenda itself. So we back all the way up to the agenda. We're we're kind of proposing to change the layout a little bit of the agenda for these meetings. Give a little synopsis right in the agenda of each GML that we reviewed for that past month, and then um, attaching a little, like a little more detail with the um, with the returns that we've done. And for those that are new, we do we don't always do a full blown report for each GML application that we've received. We have a list that we can distribute to you, and we'll send over of of basically situations that allow us to just send the municipality a return letter saying that there's no there's no negative effect to any other individuals in the municipality. We see like everything is fine with the project. Usually they're really easy like subdivisions that you know that are within the two point four acres where you know it won't be affecting any you know offsets or there's proper road frontage and everything is there. So and those we can it's nice that when we can turn those around to the municipalities because then they don't have to wait for it to come through planning board, our planning board. We can send those right back to the municipality and they can tweak them in sometimes to their next, you know, so they they don't have to wait that, that couple months lag. So, but we also want to make sure that you guys are all aware of the ones that we're sending and have enough information. Somebody brings it up, you know, kind of what was going on, how it was laid out. And sometimes we have questions about those oh, yeah. returns, even though they are returned to the municipality. Absolutely. You know, and sometimes we had a little conversation, a little back and forth with, you know, the, the municipal attorney or their code officer, you know, and they answered some of our questions so that we can determine. Yeah, we can just do a return. But, um, so, like we said. You do have a deadline date for what the um, Yes, yes. There's a there's a deadline date, um, but the for the return letters, the, those uh, we can take up until the Friday. Well, you know, I mean, there's in order for us to get it. Um, so those the return letters are not um, they're not beholding that GML deadline date that there is. So and we've also been explaining to some people, and I think I spoke to both of you, that we've had some calls of some people that, um, you know, are a little like, well, you have this, this deadline date on the GML, why do you need such a long time period? But sometimes we get GMLs that are a little more 
you know, involved and we have coordinated review committee meetings and we'll call the local, you know, fire chief or the county health department, soil and water, and we bring everybody involved, including the applicant. We'll invite them. And we've begun also including the local code officer because sometimes there's some background history to these projects that we're not even aware of. And, you know, sometimes the local code officer um, has, you know, their own questions that they bring up concerns after we've done our report and, you know, or there's, there's other things there. So we just like the opportunity to bring everybody to the table. Let's all hash out any questions or any concerns we have. And then we feel like we can write the best report after we sat down. All, all the players. So that that deadline gives us gives us enough time to do that. And just so you guys know, we have been just to be completely transparent. We do get some applications in on like the Monday when they were due on Friday. And you know, at the same time, we we don't want to be you know the we don't want to stop progress either. And we understand that business owners are working really hard to try to get some of these projects done and you know we had an instance where you know there was a you know it's a code officer's second jury duty on friday when he was you know and, and he was getting the last stuff buttoned up and he couldn't get it to us on friday i mean if, if we've got the time and we can handle it then, then we do take it we we don't take them you know like a week or a week and a half late but if it's just a few days we tended to try to be accommodated I'm hoping that won't bite us in the butt, but, you know. Any, anybody have any questions about that or? I found that as a former member of the planning board, municipal planning board, um, there's a lot of lack of communication between the code enforcement officer and the town board, planning board, whatever it is. And the code officer is usually the one that knows the regulations inside and out and what would be required before it's being sent to us. And a lot of times he gets overlooked and so therefore we get the application here without the variance being noted that it needs to have a variance for that or something else along that line. So I think it would be imperative to kind of bring these municipality um, with attention to contacting their code enforcement officer and making sure that submittal to us has been thoroughly covered between both the town board and the um, code enforcement officer. That's a great point. And as we update these things and that form that we're showing you, we want to make that a PDF, um, a fillable PDF that's accessible from our website. Our our website, you know, as can I feel like there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, the county just recently updated their website in general. And there was growing pains with it, but a lot of municipalities don't even have their own website. And so our goal is, like over the next year, to have the not only the fillable PDF GML available, but a GML guidebook, like a guidebook. We found that a county, Shenango County, has a great one. It's just a guidebook that outlines the process that. So any judge from off the street that wants to do, you know, site that wants to build a building and needs to do a site plan review or, you know, a subdivision, a major subdivision or a minor, can go right to our website, read the GML guidebook. And in the GML guidebook, like a quick link to each municipality, like here's your contact, where are you from? Okay, you know, you're from Taylor, click here for your contact information for your, you know, code enforcement office and go to them for the specifics. But yeah, kind of hopefully take a little bit of that load off of them too, because it'll all be outlined and a lot of people seem confused. Like how does this process process work? You know, do I send it right to the county? Does it go to the town first? Why does it go back to the town? And, and honestly, I've talked to some other town planning board members that, you know, I think the attention isn't really drawn to our recommendations. I mean, let's face it, a huge percent of the time we're approving these, these projects with recommendations. And that's the key, is that we, we don't want to stop progress. And a lot of times they're great proposals, but there's some 
key things that we, we want people to note. Just make sure you have, you know, snow storage available or make sure that this is addressed. And, you know, it's, we don't have a place to circle back around and make sure that that's actually being taken care of. We have to trust that the municipality is going to be taken care of that. And, you know, we're not, some of the larger municipalities, definitely, but some of the smaller ones just don't really have the resources to really devote that much time and attention. So, you know, we'd like to, we'd like to just kind of help as much as we possibly can on that. And it, I met with the Stolen Town Board on Monday, this past Monday night. Um, and one thing I talked to them about, and Alex and I have been uh, planning on, is uh, the training, the mandatory training for the Planning and Zoning Board that they have to have. Part of my conversation with Chris Eastman, there's, there's four hours, and I don't know if you guys know this too, but uh, planning board members are required to have four hours of training. Um, now, I, the state is pretty pretty relaxed in what they they count as you know training. They're pretty, there's a big leeway, so we can basically you know curtail what we need to for the municipality. In the past, they used to just have presentations in the auditorium and they provide peace signs, so all the code enforcement officers could come, or or and the planning board members could come and get their hours in and. The presentations do it all in one call group. But with COVID, there's a lot of hesitation we don't really want to get. And from what I understand, it was up for itself like 100, 120, or 30 uh, people would attend it. Mm -hmm. So it's a really great resource. But, you know, we we can't really be doing that for them right now. But we also don't want to hang them out to dry. And last, even at Stolen, there were a few board members that said, I don't even have internet set to my house. You know, I can't get online and do the training that you're emailing out. So Alex has been kind enough to offer as well to do local specific training for each municipality. Kind of build out, here's what your code is. Because everybody has different nuances to their code. And it doesn't always benefit the planning board members to know you know, understand some of the big stuff that's happening in Portlandville, you know, uh, where it's just, it's just a different, it's a different time. So we can help them, you know, we could train each one and maybe just, you know, two hours of in-person training and then we can provide them other resources. Um, but, you know, we'd really like to kind of hit the ground running with that from the beginning of next year and some boards are having members come on and, we felt like it might be the right time to just kind of kickstart that and also introduce ourselves to the municipality. We want the we want the planning board and the code enforcement officers to feel comfortable with us, to know us on, you know, and I know Dan has been here for over 30 years and, you know, you spend that much time with people, you really build a relationship with the members and, you know, we want, we want the municipality to feel just as comfortable uh, reaching out to us. Plan. The goal. So again, if anybody has any suggestions, or you know, make sure you hit this here, or we seen this there. Reach out and you know the the code enforcement contact information is definitely going to be key, mm -hmm. and we want to lay that out on the website too. Mm -hmm. Thanks, great. When we send back an application, we recommend approval with conditions. And most of the board members say, oh, approve, and they don't want to take conditions. I just have a problem with that. That's it. We recommend approval. They don't look at anything because they're not saying. So they say, oh, it's approved. So they, you know, they don't look at various recommendations that have to go along with that. I don't know how you would address that other than an in-person meeting, but right. it's really important because many people don't, they don't understand. And they, and that's, that's just, that's just, and even in my municipality, oh, we got back the recommendation for approval, and that's all anybody says. We don't even get the information, you know. Yeah. Recommendation, you probably agree with that. Recommendation mm -hmm. of approval is kind yeah. of like, it's a big window, and it doesn't mean that the local municipality has to approve it, but they have to follow the conditions. Right now. So that's good that you 
and I think that personal training is great. And if anybody has any other suggestions, maybe how we can word it differently, or you know, maybe if we had the recommendation for the beginning of the report. I mean, we we're yeah, we're not you know we're not set in stone on any of this stuff. We want we we want to give the, the board and the town the ability, you know. We want to give them the best we can because we're, you know, we're here to serve the people. We're civil service. So, you know, you tell us how we can get the best product for the taxpayer. Okay. I think that's all I have. I'm sorry. It's so long. <laughs> it's informative. Uh, we can move right into the GML report. And Alex is at the helm over there and with the report up, I can kind of let him take the lead on this. Yeah. Uh, first one we have is from the village of McGraw. Um, the applicant is Jordan Halleck at 25 East Main Street. That is his, uh, that's his house. Uh, he runs a home-based internet business out of his house um, where he buys and sells bulk cars. Um, he has told the, the code enforcement, I've talked to the code enforcement officer out there. He has told him that uh, uh, he doesn't store anything on there. It's simply online. Um, reason he's uh, getting this is because um, the uh, Department of Transportation has required that he put a sign up uh, where he keeps his records, just to, you know, he has personal data there. Um, so he's applied for a, um, a home occupation uh, and the Village of McGraw sign code allows signs with home occupations automatically. Um, only recommendations are that throughout the life of the home occupation, they follow a uh, certain um, section where uh, it just kind of outlines, you know, what can, and it, one of the many things it says is what can and can't be stored on the property. So making sure that that has followed throughout the life of, of uh, the time he's doing that. Um, and that if he does put up a sign, it has to follow um, the, the sign code as per, as per code. So uh, in compliance with seeker. Oh, I got that one. Yeah, I have a question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it helps. Oh. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it's, if it's got a red light on. Okay. Um, because home occupation is allowed in the R1 district by a special permit. Okay. Why is it? Why is he applying for this permit? Um, I believe. Let's see. I believe. I probably mixed up the terms between different municipalities. Okay. Um, okay. So it's not a district. Okay. Yeah, it would be a, a special permit okay. then. That's my fault. Sorry about that. Thanks. Mm, that could be changed then in our yeah. record yeah. here. Yep. Yeah. Recommendation. Yep. Yeah. So it's a special permit application for a special permit. Yes. Yes, special permit. The sign, the sign that the state required needs to be regulation uh, Yes. Yeah. yeah, it just needs to show that yeah. there's a business there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wasn't disclosed to me, so I'm not sure. Um, yeah. Right. That could be the assumption. Yeah. I think we were supposed to make a motion on this before, after the recommendations, and then start discussing it. So we need a motion to accept that recommendation. Anybody? Amy's made a motion. Lauren, is that a second from you? Yes. Okay. And then we can carry on with the discussion now. Thank you. Yeah, this is easy. Yeah. 
Does anybody can else just, have anything? Go ahead, can Lori. I just ask a general general question or uh, comment? When you guys are speaking, can you maybe lean into the mics? Because I'm having an awful hard time hearing tonight. Yeah, I, was, I was told by Savannah that they really are, you know, you got to go really close to them. So thank you, Lori. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions or concerns <laughs> regarding this application? No, I'm good. Just want to assure it is a, an allowed use and it's just a special permit. You're going to change that to just a special permit, right? Not a use variance. Yeah. Okay, all those in favor of the accepting staff, staff recommendation? Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? No abstentions? Okay. Thank you. All right, the uh, second one we've got today uh, from the village of Homer. Uh, it is a subdivision for Harbor Brook Flat. Uh, some of you probably remember this one coming through here before. Um, this will be the third time. Yeah, the third time you guys have seen it, the fourth time it's been, uh, been uh, applied for through us the last time. Um, was set to be for the March meeting, but then COVID happened, so got canceled and sent back. So, and those recommendations um, that we put for those were approved. Um, they just took the recommendations we had uh, through the um, village planning planning board. Um, Yeah, we tried to include um, as much background information as we thought was needed, and there, there was a lot of it. Um, so it's a bit of a long one. Trish, we're not hearing you at all. Sorry, can you hear me now? Now we can. Yes. Yeah, we couldn't hear any of what you were saying a minute ago. Sorry, I said um, there was a lot of information included with this application that was all previously provided information, but this application itself was quite simple for the subject. So I just wanted to know, it looks like there's a lot of information here, but it's mainly just the history. Right, just yeah. History. We're not Thank here you. for, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, we're not here for uh, site plan review. We're not here for the planned development district. Uh, we're simply here for a subdivision. Um, the rest of it has all been approved through the village. Um, regarding the subdivision, um, there's a there's a map attached. I hope you can all see it. Um, the only recommendation, well, I guess I'll, I'll preface it. Um, you know, you would, uh, I, I assumed uh, looking at codes, uh, for a little bit now that uh, there may need to be a uh, an area variance or something of that regard. Um, but if you do read the code, um, it, um, you know, where it says that it requires certain setbacks and frontage requirements, um, when in the um, plan development district, it says that it's for the district as a whole, not the lot. So they are allowed um, to subdivide like this within a planned development district. Um, the only recommendations I have are that um, the applicant proceed with the development of a final subdivision plat. This is a preliminary plat um, based exclusively on the design features presented uh, subject to those changes, which will be agreed upon at the time of the prelim preliminary plat review at the village. Um, that the final subdivision plat conforms to the requirements described uh, in section 198-16 of the Code of the Village of Homer, uh, and that 
all items required by the Village of Homer Planning Board Action 14 and 15 of 2020, which are simply the uh, 1 through 11 uh, requirements there that, that we gave them um, from the uh, site plan review. Uh, and then Seeker as well. Can I get a motion to accept staff's recommendations? Amy, second from somebody? Emma, okay. And how about some discussion? Anybody have any questions or concerns with it? I've got some issues. Vince is there, I guess, but I don't understand yeah. how this thing with the separate lots is going to be maintained when the lines of the subdivision split roads and parking lots and driveways. It says something about the developer doing the maintenance, but it also has things with some of the stormwater stuff is going to be on individual property lines. I don't know who's maintaining them. So the village may have an issue with the maintenance long term with the residents here. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Maybe Vince can explain because it's not a condo set where it's like the condo group and homeowners association takes care of everything except for a small lot out behind. So I don't understand how that's going to work with this separate subdivision thing. Can Vince address that if he's there? Yeah, I can chart a little bit. We talked a little bit with Kevin about that. Um, it, it obviously is very, it's a lot cleaner than either in the condo, but that is going to have uh, issues on the way it's built. And it basically is a change of project. So when we reviewed that with the village, uh, we talked about the way that the easements will be put together. The village will be Taking the road, um, we'll be we'll be donating the road to the village, and in donating the road, um, we felt that a lot of that was was uh, taken care of. We've already addressed the um, water and sewer issues with uh, with the EC and have all of that uh, finalized with them. It wasn't again, it wasn't in here. The same uh, issues that. Earlier, they've been answered already. Um, but in talking about that with Kevin, he felt that the easements associated with the with the different um, uh, properties would, would be taken care of. With that in all probability, I'm sure there's going to be some kind of a neighborhood association that goes in and does some of these things. But unfortunately, we can't dictate or regulate that. There's a lot of support. We would certainly be. Uh, we're going to be while they're being built and until all of the units are, are sold and delivered to clients. We will be taking the responsibility for the development and then providing the bill back to the individual people who we have who are enclosed on their property. So we'll be doing that while the while the property owners are there. After the property owners take that, then they will have the option of um, do that maintenance and get so Obviously, some of these are bigger, some of them are smaller. So how they how they actually handle that is really up to the property owners themselves. Yeah, but easements will be there along on to support uh, the ability to be able to do all of those things. And Vince, I would hope easements would be into a, a sort of covenant or something like that, that each homeowner would end up with and be. So I'll be right, yeah, in our, uh, and I'll be right, right into the, to the deep easements will be right, right, right in. Okay. Yeah, I guess I understand it, Vince, to some extent. I just, uh, I think there may be some issues for the village at some point with especially like the stormwater maintenance, the ponds and stuff. Some of those are on individual properties. I don't know how that's going to work unless that property is deeded over to the village or something to maintain, which Cortlandville's run into that before in the past in subdivisions. And I don't know if the village has, but I know they've had some major problems trying to sort that out with people not maintaining them and those kind of things. As long as you're maintaining them, that's fine. But once you're done developing, I'm not sure how that's going to happen. That's all. It's just kind of 
confusing the village lawyer should really look at this carefully <laughs> before they go ahead and approve this subdivision, make sure the village is covered. That's all. If we did, we did address things directly with town. Uh, I said we talked to them about that, and town was comfortable with the conversation about it. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's the village's problem at that point. <laughs> it won't be a county problem, but I just, I could see it leading to problems with all these individual lots like this without some kind of general thing. But I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. 
we either go forward or we have to change the other construction development in this like this. So in order to do that, we have to individual lot those individual buildings. Some of them are a little more traditional, some of them are not. But nothing planned, nothing on nothing on anything associated with the uh, the the proposed previous development change. There's just more lines that are drawn for you know, those individual needed areas to those people. Prior to this you would have received the need for your half of the house as a kind. So there would have still been um, 38 deeds but you would have had just at your end. And it would have been the outline of that note of your unit. And now you'll have a bigger piece of it. Um, can somebody explain, like, how is somebody supposed to get to that pro that duplex property that's in the upper right hand corner of what's being shown on the screen or to the, I mean, it comes in and there's a T for the road, but where is anybody supposed to park? How are they supposed to drive up to a duplex that's tucked into a corner behind two other buildings? I, I just don't see how anybody's supposed to park or move around in these properties back there. It's a little hard. To, it's a little hard to tell and see from the um, the plane. That's a little easier than the one that's up there. Um, again, the the actual layout of this didn't change like that. It's the, it's the, it's the exact same map that that was reviewed and the village went back through and, and approved. Um, all of the all of the units have um, have driveways in front of their garage, and the village is um, parking in the requirements and things are two two per unit. So each of them have a garage and a driveway in front. So all of those are still there within this uh, within this plan. So I think the one in particular that Bo was talking about, if that individual would need to cross over if their driveway crosses over those other lots as shown in this picture. They, those other, they would have a deed of right. Yes, yes. So is there any parking on the street there? I mean, is there restricted to the road so it can handle more than most? Yeah, no, the village, the village didn't want to have the parking. The village, will, will, the village will actually have, will actually own the street. So if they wanted, if they so choose to allow parking, they could. I don't believe they are. They talked about maybe maybe we'll do one side, the other side, but again, that's kind of for them to to decide and agree upon if that's what they would really like to do uh, to be able to do that. I do. Um, on the very last page of this proposal. There is a, another map that shows parking. Keep, yeah, keep going down. And if we're looking at, I guess this is where I'm confused um, because it shows parking, but then on the other map that we were just looking, I think it's that one right there, yeah. Um, you have you have um, buildings there where it shows all this parking. So I guess I'm confused on that. See the top right hand corner, like where Bo was just talking about, where the how are we going to have buildings? You know, how are they going to get into there? So is this not the same? No, Lord, that, that um, plan is from a previous application. Um, remember, we said we attached the old um, applications that okay. were gone through already, 
and we just attach those for informational purposes. Um, but those are have been superseded at this point. So the okay. one, the one that's just attached to to uh, to the the recommendation, that's the most current. There's just some verbiage, and there are some explanations, some project explanations in those the, the documentation from the old commissions that we felt might give you a better understanding if you haven't known about this project previously. And that's why that's included. But that, that's an old plan. So the original plan or the plan from maybe the 90s or something, before we were involved in it, we had 12 single family homes and then four, four unit apartments. So it was kind of a mixed project plan. And when we looked at it, we said that's not that's not going to work. It's not you know, feasible. It, it's kind of screwed up. Look at mixing, uh, mixing departments and things. But that's what that drawing depicts, I believe, was that previously approved plan before uh, Arbor Brook got it. So that's part of the project that you're showing. Those are strictly for the multiple units. There's no extra parking for extra business, right? Correct. There are the old, and again, that's the old, old plan. So, there are, uh, it's a 2013 or 14 plan. Again, I guess I don't have a major problem with the separate subdivision where they're splitting up driveways and stuff like that, um, because people do that on like, you know, lake properties and that kind of stuff. But I do have concern over all the stormwater maintenance. I know that's been a hassle in other places and they ended up like. The town had to take over property and get easements to get in to maintain them because the homeowners weren't doing it or on the individual lots. So I see a problem down the road for the village if if all that stormwater system is one system and it's you got five people trying to take care of it in, in one area. You got like 10 ponds on this thing and each one of the ponds is split like two or three or four or five properties. And I just don't know how that's going to be taken care of. So, and you know, so each one, every one of those stormwater ponds is split with several properties. If everyone on the board agrees, we could make a add another recommendation. That that's not going through. They they couldn't hear you with that. Oh, can everybody hear me? I'm sorry. Um, it's if the board um, agrees, we could add another recommendation um, that the town, you know, just make note that the town takes serious consideration to the maintenance of stormwater. And they may not want to do that either. I know most villages and towns don't want to take over these things, but they end up having to do it at times. I know Cortlandville have had to do it on all theirs. So is there some friendly amendment you want to add to the recommendations that you could think of a wording for as for our I don't know what to do, Dave. I just want to make sure that the village knows what they're getting into here, that maybe those easements to allow them the village to get back onto these properties to maintain them if the homeowners aren't or something, and a way to assess the homeowners if it becomes a problem. Because I know it's happened in other towns where the subdivisions like this and those facilities are, are on individual lots or split with lots and um, and the homeowners just don't take care of them. They don't care. Okay. Um, Mr. Hall, do you have any Maybe there's a way to word it with like the, the provide easements or something for the, the village if they're necessary to get in and take care of facilities like they're doing. They're doing the water and the sewer. And that's on the public road, which they're going to take over and maintain. But the storm sewer systems are not on the public road. They're back in the back of all these lots. And someone's got to take care of those things. So maybe there's a way to like leave an easement for the town, the, the village to do that or something. I don't know. And that would then I understand the drive easements and the cross. 
I think Chuck, that's where the conversation with Tim and Company was that they wanted those easements. We, we had meetings with the with the village officials to talk about what they wanted from a roadway standpoint for the easements, and they were going to they got back to us with exactly their requirements and things because um, Brand wanted to start writing up the easement, you know, with, with the road. Good work, if you will, going just to kind of get the the paperwork drafted out and uh, the easement discussion that moved into the some of the stormwater as well. So I believe that that was the solution to it was easements associated with them the, in the location that they needed to be there. Uh, some of them they would have already had uh, some of the conversations. And that that may be fine with them. Again, I know when we do subdivisions in other towns and we have stormwater systems that those are separated out as separate lots and deeded over to the municipality to maintain if the municipality wants to take them. But some municipalities don't want to get involved in that and leave it up to some other group to take care of. But you can work that out with the village. I guess I'll you know, and they're happy with it as long as they're aware that they might be opening up a can of worms here. <laughs> Well, if you would like, we could add that recommendation to the list here with just declaring that we have concerns about easement for all uh, utilities, uh, right of way, um, storm systems, and maintenance thereof. What do you think, Chuck? How, do you, how would you like to word it? Uh, the village should take into consideration. Uh, Stormwater maintenance system have easements or something to make sure they're maintained. So I know they don't have a problem with the water and sewer because that's all on the public road and the gas and all that kind of stuff, but stormwater isn't. So they should at least take that into account. We can add something to your recommendations that the village consider that prior to approving the subdivision or how that's going to happen. Okay, how do I work this into our uh, rules of order here? Do we need to withdraw the first approval? Which who who made the first approval? Amy, Amy, second by Emma. Emma, do you want to withdraw yours? Yeah. Can we just amend it so I don't have to do that? Or yeah, Chuck, yes. aren't, aren't you just amending the recommend, staff's recommendation with your I just, additional? I don't think I have to withdraw. I think we're just amended to add one more item or something like that. Okay, do we need a motion to amend? I'll make the motion to amend it. I don't going to say that. That's going to say that the village take into consideration how the maintenance of the stormwater system will take care, place. When you can I get a second on that motion to amend the recommendation? I'll second the motion. This is Bo. Oh, thank you. And maybe, Patricia, when you have wording that you're. So, how about the village should take into consideration? Lisa. Oh, <laughs> that the, that the village should take into consideration maintenance pertaining to stormwater runoff. Because the utilities are already addressed. So we're just concerned about the stormwater and drainage storage system and maintenance thereof. So the village should take into consideration maintenance pertaining to stormwater runoff, drainage, and maintenance. System. Yeah, well, they're the, the approved stormwater plan. They've got a plan that shows all the stuff out there, as long as the maintenance of whatever is approved in that plan, and they got all those plans. So, maintenance of the approved stormwater system. Yeah, maintenance of the approved. Swift, really. I mean, the whole. Yeah, just refer to the whole swift. Everybody, anybody else have any other questions before we all the questions?
people have. Uh, I think that some different than any other housing situation now. You have an area that's yours, you have garage rights, you have areas around it that are yours. What do I believe happens? I believe a homeowner neighborhood association probably together, put together, and get somebody to plow and do some of those kinds of things. I would believe they would do that. Well, I'm sorry, I can't hear whoever is speaking. It's the with the user, uh, with who, who's got them. Legally, technically, they're all, uh, they're all uh, associated with that name. So how they would choose to individually do that, maybe somebody says, I'll plow, you know, I've got to plow, I'll plow. They can't do it. Dan, they, they can't hear you on the... Uh... Sorry. I can't put a condominium association or homeowners association in with the with the bill schedule that it is. That's what we've been we've been attempting to do that with the AG's office for fifteen years. And it gave up can't do it anymore. Either out of the perspective or or self press. So but the, it has been one of the one of the issues that we've been trying to say this would be so much more better public situation if you would allow us to do it in this way. Well, the buildings themselves are again the same thing as you know, it breaks with another right. yeah. that, is, that is an issue in there with, with the duplexes, of course. Anybody else have any concerns, questions? Well, that's a good question. All those in favor of approving the staff's recommendations with the amended uh, portion regarding the storm sewers. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Good luck. <laughs> and I do want to these folks have been phenomenal through this process. Hopeful, they've been supportive. agenda today is also from the village of Homer. Uh, it's a site plan review um, for uh, the properties owned by DM3 of Cortland. Uh, it's owned by Alton Ainsley. Uh, it is the, uh, there's kind of three buildings, now two. Oh, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. Um, these are the buildings that are at the corner of um, of uh, Homer Ave and Water Street, or Main, sorry, uh, and Water Street, um, just south of the um, uh, town hall, town of Homer Hall. Um, they are looking at, there's already residential on the second floor. They're looking at uh, adding uh, one more unit on the, four, or on the third floor. Um, and revamping all of them to be elevator accessible. Uh, on the first floor, um, they are going to be revamping it into a restaurant use. Um, the sorry to interrupt, but I just want to note that some people may have noted this the front of this building has three fronts uh, previously, and um, they were planning on renovating all three of them, but a structural engineer entered the middle building and decided that it was terribly 
they left most buildings, most from the corner. So that has been torn down at this point. Um, and in its place, they're putting a patio section for the um, kind of a three seasons patio um, concept. Uh, it looks kind of cool. Um, where that building used to stand for the restaurant. Um, let's see. And then uh, the only recommendations I have for it are that. Uh, I, I had a couple of recommendations. I talked to the architect about parking. Um, uh, the parking spaces shown in the site plan weren't quite big enough to meet the code. Um, and uh, he, he said that he would alter it, but uh, it's going to be a recommendation on here as well. Uh, make sure that it meets the code, so 200 square feet, minimum width of 10 feet. Um, or they obtain a waiver of, you know, instead they can do either one. Um, that the village planning board waived off the, uh, waived the off street parking and loading requirements. Um, it, they are within the central business district zone. Um, in the code, it says that they are, the planning board is allowed to waive the uh, parking minimum requirements. Um, that would need to be done. There is, there's, um, nowhere near enough uh, area in this um, in this parcel to accommodate um, the off street parking requirement. Um, that the applicant coordinate with uh, SHPO uh, and that they comply with uh, secret requirements. With that parking, you'll know you can see it's really clear in the application that the village the village hall is right across. Can I get a motion to accept the staff's recommendation? <laughs> I'll make that. Please, Jeff, thank you. A second? I'll second. It's Bo. I'll second. Oh, okay, thank you. Now we can discuss. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I, I definitely have concerns with the parking, too. Um, I, I kind of was wondering, that's a huge, beautiful patio area. Maybe we don't have to have it that big so we can accommodate a few more parking spaces. What do we have? Only on that side of the building, there were six, I believe, and two of them are handicapped. On the um, south side of the building, there are existing businesses along there, and even the aerial map shows they are full. And there are some other parking spots in that area, but not enough to even come near the 84 that is required. <laughs> I don't know even if the city hall parking would accommodate that many, you know, or, or even near that many. I was going to say that would be my biggest concern as well is that I don't think even the parking lot right next door that going to with that is probably going to be a little bit more than the private house that goes along with the open or something, yeah. Mm -hmm. Repeat that, please. Go ahead. Lord, I think she said to repeat that, please. Yeah, because I couldn't hear what she was saying. I'm sorry, I said that my concern was that how would the parking next door to that building affect the existing businesses? Uh, also, but, yeah. Yeah. I wondered about um, Parking on the street right in front of it. And, you know, it, they said after hours would be a majority of the business, probably, which would be all right to take up those other um, public parking areas. But what happens during lunch hour and like that? You know, the city hall parking lot is going to be full already. So I don't know. I mean, they might just consider trying to revise some of the building, the huge kitchen. <laughs> And how many apartments would be upstairs? How many parking spaces will they need for each apartment? 
So you need two per apartment, and there are four. There will be four apartments. There's three right now. So there's large state of that for both buildings with four apartments up there? Yes. There was three now, too. Right. Yeah. So they need eight, eight designated parking spaces for these tenants. Just for the tenants. Right. right. Yeah. And if they don't have a designated parking lot, where are the designated going to be? I would like to see at least and provide for the tenants that were there. I mean, as a necessity, if you can't provide for the tenant spacing, you can't expect, you know, customers to come in and take your tenant spaces, but that's just my thought. Doesn't he own the property right immediately to the south, the same people? And the yes. now they used to be the other, and that shows that survey map shows an easement for parking for the building to the north. So, at least the survey map seems to indicate that. So, he's got some parking in the old, uh, whatever that <laughs> place, the, the old building just south. It's also a restaurant. So, <laughs> I don't know if he's going to keep that as a restaurant or what. So, they also, um, the building that they have in He told me that he's in the process of acquiring that property to do that. And that could be the parking that is much needed. Hopefully, the we got was with the increased move toward walkability in urban settings. Um, I think that there's kind of that movement for residents to walk to their business destination and you know and I think that that was kind of part of their the concept um and, and you know we felt that the, the village you know the village is comfortable now to make an action um to more and make sure that they're paying really close attention to that lack of parking um, but I think the, uh, that that movement kind of toward less driving, more walking, and I think you know with um, you know like Asher right down the street, that's like a dead parking area, and a lot of people tend to use the parking lot they and the center and that other kind of you know, municipal parking lot across the street there. Maybe if the recommendations, instead of saying the village planning board waived the off street parking and loading requirements that we say that they look into, you know, that or that we have concerns about that. And I just, I don't think we should just say, go ahead and waive it, that we are recommending that they waive it. I think they should try and work toward. Yeah. The village planning board closely reviewed the off street parking and loading requirements. <clears throat> or consider, closely consider. Anybody else have any ideas there? What, what to, what you would like to see for parking? I, I tend, actually, I, I personally tend to agree with the way that the staff's recommendation is written. Um, I, I think, you know, Trish is right that these are the sorts of renovations we want to see in our in our downtown cores, be it Homer, be it Cortland, wherever, where we don't stifle the transition uh, from first floor business and top floor um, apartments because we get tripped up by the the concerns about parking, um, you know, and and then have and then our towns become parking lots. To try to accommodate, you know, so many spaces per apartment per use. Um, I, I like the recommendation to waive the off street parking. Um, I think this is a great change for that part of Homer. Um, there is, you know, a, a good bit of parking here. There are some options around for 
people who are coming in to visit, but um, you know, to worry that do we have a full two spaces per potential apartment unit? It it just trips us up into paving over more and more of our downtown cores to try to accommodate these possibilities of cars when people are moving towards more walkabilities, bikeability, um, telecommuting, uh, single car families, you know, those sorts of things. So I, I prefer, personally stay with, would like to stay with the recommendations from staff. I'm going to disagree, Bo, because I work in the right downtown in Homer. And right now, Homer is very lacking of parking. Um, you go down there 8 o'clock in the morning or you go down there at, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the afternoon and businesses, um, they, there is no parking for businesses. You go out for lunch, you come back, good luck finding a parking spot. And I think that, yeah, it's great to get business in there. But you have to accommodate for parking because the parking right now in Homer is a mess because of the schools and because of the businesses that are in there. I I think we need to make a recommendation that they get more parking. I could see, you know, offering the waving in our recommendations if it weren't so drastically out of whack here. 84 required, six provided. I mean, that's way, I mean, if you're going to build something, you have to accommodate for all, a, a majority of it, not all of it, just the majority of it. And it's very lacking what they're accommodating for as far as means of travel and parking. I do want to clarify there's more parking to the south on there, it's not just six on top. Yeah. Right, right. But also Actually, there's businesses there that accommodate for those parking spaces right. already. Share an access drive. Mm -hmm. I would agree with Bo and this circumstance in particular. I think if there was 84 parking spots here, that would be to the historic character of, of Homer's. I think that would be to its detriment. Um, I would hate to see that many parking spots in the village of Homer. I can think of other um, historic buildings too, as well, historic restaurants that have absolutely no parking spots. It's all on street parking um, and it's literally never been an issue for the past 80 years. So I don't think that this should be any exception just because it's being refurbished. So I, I agree with your opinion, Bo. I like it as it stands. Yes, I, I didn't expect to have it totally accommodated for by any means whatsoever. I was just kind of hinting in the recommendations that would be a little more, um, give it a little more push and thought into parking that they might be able to provide. But I agree, there's no way they're going to ever come near the requirements that the town has set forward. So, but I'll leave it up to you guys to want to leave the recommendation. I do not know that. Do you know that? Can you guys hear? No. no. I, I was asking if there are a uh, time limit for parking on the street. I don't know that. But no, there isn't. Find, okay, so you might find residents taking up parking spaces that could be used for business. I mean, I don't know what the answer is. It's just, I don't know. On the other hand, the planning board does have the option of regulating the curve. They do have that option. So it's kind of in, it's in their court. It would be great if that rear lot behind there were to become vacant. But do we act on something that is a possibility that it might or might not? I'll weigh in. I kind of go along with Bo on this one too, because like Cortland has no requirements for downtown parking for businesses. They're not required to provide it. And there are some municipal lots in home where I don't know how many spots they have, but uh, there are some out behind the main drag. And I've never had a problem getting parking, like to go to Dashers and stuff like that. But uh, again, I don't know. There's two or three more restaurants might make it a lot more crowded down there at night. I don't know. But I kind of like the idea of not having as many parking spots and 
some of the requirements in these old ordinances are kind of overkill, in my opinion, but uh, especially the size of some of these parking spots. Uh, Cortland recently reduced the size of their lots, or their parking spots from the 10 by 20s to 9 by 17. So the less asphalt we have, the better off downtowns are going to be. Anybody else? Okay, let's all those in favor of staff recommendation. Aye. 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 Anybody opposed? No abstention. Uh, Lori, you're opposed? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's the last. That's it for the GML. I've, there's two return letters this uh, this time around. You had any questions on those? But otherwise, that's it. Oh yeah, I can say. I I added uh, maps to the return letters this time. Little change I thought might be better than just words. So just two subdivisions. They weren't major. Yeah, this one was a little confusing. It was. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, it, it explained it down there. I thought a map is worth a million words. There's no questions on that one. Second one is another simple subdivision, just uh, taking off um, this six acre parcel here from the rest of his land so we can solve the rest of it. We felt it. We felt they met the um, requirements laid out in the. Yeah. Hey, anybody have any announcements? Our next meeting will be October 20th. Is this the location, this room from this point forward? <laughs> yeah, so so until you hear otherwise, we will plan on having an optional meeting um, in person uh, or via WebEx if you prefer. And, um, you know, we would just request that you let us know as soon as possible so that Alex and I don't show up to an empty room essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, um. Trish, I, my personal opinion, it's really hard to have these uh, mixed meetings where some people are there and some people remote because mm -hmm. we really can't hear the people there very well at all. And it might be better to be all remote or all there if we're going to do it. I don't like personally in place meetings right now because of things going around, but uh, it's really hard to hear you guys out in that room. These microphones are really tough. You have to literally have it almost in your mouth to for it to pick up your voice. But um, but I, I definitely see your point. I mean, if if everyone is in agreement, we wanted to meet in person uh, this this meeting in particular because Emma and Dan are new to board, and you know we wanted to meet that in person and 
we had a lot of material to go over, um, you know, with our revised new formats of some of those forms. Um, but we are absolutely fine with meeting via WebEx for everyone. You know, if, if everybody agrees, we have no problem with that. We we uh, were we were meeting. Uh, we found out that you know it kind of was going back and forth for a while as far as the regulation on votes to actually counting. So now our votes do count via WebEx again. Okay. Uh, yeah. My question. Yeah. Um, they do. That was just reinstated. Well, you might know a little bit better than I do because it was a full county for the legislature and all. Um, yeah, Governor Hochul extended the uh, the online option for boards like ourselves through um, mid January. Yeah. So if, if everyone prefers, um, we can do WebEx until further notice. I know some of our um, Paul. I don't know if you're there. He, I think he has a hard time with internet connection. I'm out in the boonies, and it's, I've been okay. But one night I was on the phone for one. You know. <laughs> and, Again, if you figure out the sound problem, I wouldn't have an issue. It's just I mean, we couldn't hear you guys very often when you're trying to talk, so we we're getting a garbled thing, <laughs> and we we're all on. WebEx or Zoom, you can actually hear the people as long as we're not talking over each other. But so I don't if you can fix the problem, I don't care. It's just really hard to hear people. It is kind of new. We all are not talking into the microphone because we never had to before. So maybe we can learn to I think both can see to the legislators kind of getting used to it too. Um it took a little while. Well, let's see what happens for the month meeting. Yeah, and we can also keep an eye on uh, can keep an eye on cases, see how the trend is looking, um, and reevaluate. So I can always send out a doodle poll, um, or you know, see see what the overwhelming majority, um, you know, wants to. Do. Yeah, we should try and get our responses back to who's going to be in attendance and how the attendance will be, whether it will be. Yeah. Uh, WebEx or yeah. in person. Yeah. But like I said, this time I, I felt like I, I just wanted to see, you know, I knew Emma and Dan were coming in person here, so we wanted to accommodate for that. But moving forward, we have to promise that without anybody else. I don't think I have a six-year-old. Run through the <laughs> Okay, can I get a motion to adjourn? Thank you. <laughs> We're lacking you guys in the background for making motions and accepting. I think you're <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye, Thank guys. Next time. Bye. 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 Bye.